Hi everybody, welcome back to this lecture series for our next lecture on molecular biology. In the last lecture, we'd been getting into our overview of gene expression, discussing the different steps involved in producing a protein given a DNA sequence. Before completing our overview of that process, we'll spend most of this lecture reviewing the chemical structure and function of proteins. Coming back to the core idea of the central dogma, we see here that a protein is produced through the translation of an RNA sequence, which itself is transcribed from DNA. We've already discussed DNA replication and transcription of DNA sequence into RNA, but before we get into the details of translation, we're going to revisit some of the basics of protein biochemistry. We know that proteins are made up of amino acids that are linked together in sequence. This is encoded in DNA. Here in figure 3.20 of your text, we have a generalized view of a protein coding gene, its transcribed mRNA, and the protein sequence that is produced. Features of the gene are illustrated, including the region of the gene that codes for protein, called the open reading frame, or ORF. This begins with a start codon and ends with a stop codon. Flanking the open reading frame are upstream and downstream regions that do not code for protein but are transcribed into mRNA. Transcription of the DNA sequence into RNA begins at the transcription initiation site and ends at the transcription termination site. These are defined sequence elements on DNA that we will discuss in later lectures. Once again, one strand of DNA acts as the template. The other, non-template strand, has the same sense as the transcript. Only part of the sequence transcribed into RNA is eventually translated into protein. In addition to this coding region are the 5' untranslated region, or 5' UTR, and the 3' untranslated region, or 3' UTR. Finally, the protein sequence is polymerized from the mRNA template in the coding region by ribosomes through translation, a process we will discuss in later lectures. The sequence of amino acids translated is determined by base triplets called codons. Amino acids, of course, are the building blocks of proteins. These amino acids are linked by peptide bonds to form polymers known as polypeptides, and a protein can consist of one or more polypeptides. There are 20 amino acid building blocks found in proteins. This is in contrast to the four bases found in DNA and RNA. Consequently, we need multiple bases to encode an amino acid. The side chains of these 20 amino acids have different chemical functionality. For example, these could be polar, hydrophobic, acidic, basic, or aromatic side chains. The polypeptides that are made up of these amino acids can fold into different three-dimensional structures, which we'll discuss shortly. Here's a closer look at the amino acid building blocks that make up polypeptides and proteins. Each of these amino acids has an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. The different amino acids each have distinct side chains, represented here by R, and illustrated here on figure 3.2 from your textbook showing the 20 amino acids found in proteins. The figure also shows the names of these amino acids along with their three-letter abbreviations and the one-letter codes conventionally used to write the sequence of amino acids in proteins. These different amino acids can be grouped by the similarities of their side chains. Shown on the figure in this slide are amino acids grouped together based on functionality. For example, whether their side chains have functional groups that are electrically charged at neutral pH, or if the side chains are polar or nonpolar. There are other ways that amino acids can be grouped as well. For example, we can group together amino acids that have aromatic side chains, or we could group together amino acids that have small side chains versus those that have large bulky side chains. These amino acid building blocks are joined together through peptide bonds, and chains of amino acids are called polypeptides. A protein is made up of at least one polypeptide, but can consist of multiple polypeptide subunits. 
Amino acid residues in a polypeptide are linked through peptide bonds formed between the amino group of an amino acid to the carboxylic acid group of the preceding amino acid. Therefore, peptides have a polarity, with an amino group at one end, the amino or N-terminus, and a carboxylic acid group at the other end, the carboxyl or C-terminus. The figure here from your textbook shows the formation of a peptide bond through a condensation reaction between the amino group and the carboxylate group. However, this isn't quite how it happens for protein synthesis in the cell. As we will discuss next lecture, amino acids are linked to tRNA as amino acyl tRNAs when they are brought to the protein synthesis machinery, the ribosome, which has a peptidyl transferase activity. This catalyzes the formation of a peptide linked to tRNA, which can then be further elongated. Now that we have covered the amino acid building blocks, we'll move on to an overview of protein structure. There are multiple orders of protein structure. These can be broken down into primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. The primary structure is simply the linear sequence of amino acids linked by peptide bonds. Conventionally, an amino acid sequence is written from the N-terminus to the C-terminus unless otherwise specified. This is the same direction in which proteins are synthesized. Shown here as examples are the primary amino acid sequences of the protein myoglobin and the hemoglobin alpha subunit. Note that these sequences are written with the one-letter code for amino acids, in contrast to the three-letter abbreviations shown on the left. Protein secondary structure is made up of three-dimensional structural elements that form in local segments of polypeptides. These result from the interaction of amino acid residues with their neighbors in nearby sequence. Common types of secondary structural elements are alpha helices, as shown here, and beta sheets, as shown here. Turns, or loops as they are sometimes called, are secondary structural elements that connect alpha helices or beta sheets with one another. An alpha helix is formed when the peptide chain twists into a helix, resulting from hydrogen bonding between peptide backbone amide and carbonyl groups of near neighbor amino acids. The resulting right handed helix illustrated here has about 3.6 amino acid residues per turn. The hydrogen bonds between amide and carbonyl groups is shown by dotted lines. On the right of this figure is a drawing with just the backbone carbon and nitrogen atoms in an alpha helix to show a simpler view of how the backbone twists. We also see in this image here, alpha helices are often represented in renderings and drawings as a ribbon shape. You may also notice that the side chains, represented as orange balls here, face out away from the helical axis. This may be slightly more clear in this drawing, where the side chains are represented by green balls. Also shown here is a diagram that illustrates which amides and which carbonyl groups hydrogen bond with each other. We see that this distance of between 3 and 4 residues accounts for the number of amino acids per turn. Now, the other kind of secondary structural element, beta sheets, are made up of stretches of extended polypeptide chain arranged side by side. These can be arranged in a parallel fashion, with the polypeptide stretches going in the same direction from the N-terminal to the C-terminal end, or they can be arranged in an anti-parallel fashion, with the polypeptide stretches going in alternate directions from the N-terminal to the C-terminal end. When they are arranged in this fashion, the amides and carbonyl groups line up like this to hydrogen bond, here in these two strands that are parallel, or in these two strands that are anti-parallel. As you can see, the side chain residues, represented here as green balls, point away from the plane of the sheet, alternating in which side of the sheet they extend outward from. Beta sheets can be represented like this, as side-by-side -side ribbon arrows, and here we see that this beta sheet consists of both parallel strands and anti-parallel strands. In this view here, we see the broad side of the beta sheet, 
whereas here we see the side view. These secondary structural elements come together and fold up in a higher order structure consisting of the total three-dimensional fold of a polypeptide chain, which is called the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure of a polypeptide can consist of one or more domains. Domains are part of the protein that can independently fold into 3D structural regions. Examples of single domain proteins are shown here in these figures from your textbook, illustrating myoglobin and guanadinoacetate methyltransferase. The representation of the latter depicting alpha helices and beta sheets as helical ribbons and flattened arrows. Quaternary structure refers to the three-dimensional structure of multiple polypeptide subunits coming together in a particular arrangement to form a complex, multi-subunit protein. An example of quaternary structure is shown here in an IgG-type antibody, which consists of two light chains and two heavy chains, each of which is a separate polypeptide that folds into multiple domains and associate together to form a multi-subunit protein. Another example is hemoglobin which consists of two alpha subunits, shown in red, and two beta subunits, shown in blue, therefore having a quaternary structure made up of four polypeptides. So far, we've talked about the three-dimensional structure of proteins as though they are static. However, protein structure is dynamic and can change conformation over time and in different conditions, as illustrated in this animated structure of lysozyme. So, protein dynamics looks at protein structure beyond three dimensions in space, considering how the structure changes with time. The structure of a protein plays a very important role in determining its function. The example shown in this slide is that of an enzyme that catalyzes some biological reaction. The structure of an enzyme can allow it to specifically interact with a substrate the positioning of key functional groups in the amino acid sequence being determined by how the protein folds in three dimensions, these being important to substrate binding and turnover. The dynamics of the protein structure in this example allows the enzyme to form an induced fit and position active site amino acid residues for catalysis. The idea that proteins carry out gene functions dates back to the early 1900s, in 1902, a physician named Garrod observed patients with a disease called alcaptonuria, which resulted from an accumulation of this molecule, homogentosate, causing the urine to turn black as one of its symptoms. The inheritance of this illness appeared to be genetic, caused by a single gene and inherited as a recessive trait. Garrod reasoned that the cause was a defective metabolic pathway in the breakdown of phenylalanine, and that the gene associated with this trait encoded the enzyme that metabolizes homogentosate. In other studies in the 1940s by Beadle and Tatum, on their experimental organism Neurospora crassa, a kind of bread mold, these researchers found that certain mutants of the mold strain required supplementation with pentathenate, otherwise known as vitamin B5 because the mutants could not biosynthesize this vitamin on their own, whereas the wild-type strain could produce its own pantothenate through the pathway illustrated here. Deficiency in pantothenate production through this pathway was heritable following Mendelian inheritance, and so Beadle and Tatum concluded that the mutants were deficient in a metabolic enzyme and that that enzyme was encoded by a gene. These two examples were evidence that genes code for proteins, originally proposed as what was called the one gene, one protein hypothesis, but later refined to the one gene, one polypeptide hypothesis, since proteins can consist of more than one polypeptide, each of which could be coded by a different gene. Proteins can carry out multiple functions in a cell. For example, as we just saw, they can act as enzymes that catalyze biochemical reactions. Some proteins help in forming cellular shape and structure. Proteins can also carry signals, for example, as hormones, and bind and carry substrates, for example, hemoglobin, which binds to oxygen and carries it in the bloodstream in red blood cells. 
In later lectures throughout this course, we are going to see a lot of examples of how proteins can control the activity of genes by binding to DNA and RNA. So, as a summary of protein structure and function, proteins are made up of chains of amino acids and the sequences of these amino acids are encoded on DNA in genes. These chains are linked by peptide bonds to form polypeptides and there are different orders of structure to polypeptides and proteins. Secondary structure is a local three-dimensional structure that results from nearby amino acid residues hydrogen bonding to their neighbors in the polypeptide sequence. The tertiary structure is a higher order three-dimensional structure of one entire polypeptide folding into a complete 3D fold. And the quaternary structure is the arrangement of interacting polypeptides in an assembled protein complex. As we saw in this lecture, and as we'll see again in later lectures, proteins can carry out multiple functions. In the next lecture, we will discuss the process of protein synthesis, that is, translation. But for now, that's all.